Welcome to Morningstar Christian Chapel YouTube channel. Please remember to hit that subscribe button, like button, and the notification bell so you can find out when we go live or post a new video. And be sure to leave a comment about what God has shown you in this message. Thanks, and enjoy the study. Open with me in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, the 14th chapter. It really has been the joy of my life to be here with you all the past month, and to open the Word with you is... A great privilege. We're going to be in the first 11 verses of the Gospel of Mark, the 14th chapter. When you get there, I want to read through our text of consideration this morning, and then we will get into the message. Mark 14, beginning in verse 1, says this. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came, having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do to them good. But me you do not always have. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, Wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be a memorial to her. If you're taking notes this morning, I encourage you to do so. The title of this morning's message is True Devotion. True Devotion. Oswald Chambers was, uh, is mostly noted for his devotional writings. He was also a missionary in Egypt and a chaplain during the First World War. And he is quoted for saying this. Christianity is not devotion to a work or to a cause or a doctrine, but devotion to a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what you can boil Christianity down to. You may be here this morning asking yourself in a season of your life, what is it that God would desire of me right now? And it is wholehearted devotion to the task of pleasing God. We shouldn't overcomplicate this walk with Jesus. We shouldn't overcomplicate Christianity. Jesus came into this world to save sinners. He's called you out of darkness and into light. He has redeemed you and placed a calling upon your life, and he is worthy of our adoration, our worship, and our devotion. We are living in crucial days, it goes without saying. The months and years to come will be difficult, but we've been called for such a time as this. At this crucial time in world history, half-hearted devotion will not suffice. And we don't come into this relationship with the Lord to have a half-hearted approach to Jesus. But the things of this world pull at us, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things. No Christian is immune to these temptations and these traps of this world. But as we keep Jesus at the center of our attention, though the world around us is in chaos, things are going as they should go according to biblical Uh, to, to the biblical timeline. The Christian should have one heart and one mind, and that is seeking the heart and the mind of Christ himself. And as you do that, you and I will become better discerners of the signs and the times that we live in and better understanders of what it is that the Lord desires for our lives. In our time together, we're going to examine, we're going to examine two examples of devotion to Jesus. We're going to look at the life of Mary of Bethany, who I think is one of the greatest examples of worship and devotion in all the Bible. But as we wrap up this portion of the scripture, we're also going to see pretentious and hypocritical devotion personified in the life of Jesus. And what I hope to do as we navigate through this text is to draw the comparison in both of them. We're going to spend most of our time developing And in looking into the life of Mary and the offering that she brings Jesus and how timely it was, at the end we'll consider Judas. Don't believe there's any Judases in this room. But if we're honest, 
at times in our lives, we are our own worst enemies. And our heart should be to be like Mary, to see Jesus and to be able to offer what he desires. We see, Jesus, we see Mary anointing Jesus, and we will see Judas betraying Jesus. So let's look at the text, beginning in verse 1. It's wise to consider the background. We are in the last days of the life of Christ. The Lord knows where he is headed. He has warned his disciples on multiple occasions. The Gospel of Luke says that he has set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem, knowing what awaits him there. No doubt the, um, the reality of that is gripping his mind, but the beauty of our Savior is that he's always moving forward in the face of opposition. He's always moving forward in the face of difficulty. Why? Because pleasing the heart of the Father was in his mind. And accomplishing the work that the Father had called him to do was in his mind. And he had a passion to complete his purpose. And that was salvation for you and for me. So it says this. Look at your Bibles with me. Mark 14, verse 1. It says, After two days it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. Note that. We'll come back to it later. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table. Let's stop here for a minute. It's wise to consider the events that preceded this after the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead in John 11. Many, many people believed in Jesus, but as our text said in verse 1, that the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. This was a hostile time for Jesus. The religious leaders were actively plotting to kill him. In John's account, in John chapter 11, verses 53 and 54, it says, Then from that day on they plotted to put him to death. Therefore Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and, and there he remained with his disciples. We see him now back in Bethany, two miles outside of Jerusalem, at the house of Simon the leper, a man who he had uh, cured of leprosy, John's gospel in his account, in the parallel account, gives us further insight of those who were in attendance. John 12, 1 and 2 says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. I draw your attention to these portions of Scripture, not only so that you can understand the context and the background of what's taking place right now, Jesus, in many ways, is in hiding. He raised Lazarus from the dead, and from that point, they not only were seeking to kill Lazarus, but they were seeking to plot against Jesus and kill him. But understand this background and the context, and, and who is at this table, and who is at this house with Jesus. There was a man named Simon who had been healed by Jesus. The disciples were there with him who had been called and experienced the power of Jesus. Lazarus was there who had been raised from the dead by Jesus. Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus, were there who loved Jesus. Jesus is amongst his friends. Jesus is amongst those who have experienced his power, who have heard his teachings, who have watched him heal the sick and cast out demons and raise the dead. In fact, Lazarus was raised from the dead himself. Simon was cured of leprosy. The disciples were called and a divine calling was placed upon their life. They experienced the power of the Holy Spirit working through them. All these people have experienced a personal touch with Jesus. In this room this morning, all of you, myself, we have all experienced a personal touch with Jesus. In that house, there were many whom Jesus had performed miracles for. But in the midst of this, we have one of the most stellar examples of devotion. Not a woman receiving anything from Jesus but a woman giving all that she has to Jesus. And she comes in silently, without a word, and she simply gives Jesus what is in her heart to give him. We're going to look at the significance of that. We are going to spend a lot of time in verse 3.
I think it's important to note what Jesus didn't do. We're all familiar, if you're Christians here today, we are a part of a a, a church that is a very well-taught church here. No doubt you have spent time in this account in your own devotional life. You've been taught this probably on many occasions. But we never reach the depths of what this actually means. You can never reach the depths of what this actually means to you and me in our relationship with Jesus and what an example Mary is in our lives. Notice what Jesus doesn't do. Jesus doesn't stop her. Jesus doesn't say, no, no, I'm not worthy of this. Why? Because he knew he was worthy. And he, even further, he knew that Mary knew that he was worthy. Jesus doesn't ever push away any act of sincere worship. You may be coming to Christ today saying, I, I don't know what to give to you. I have nothing to bring to you. All he desires is what is genuinely in your heart to give him. Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require of me but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with my God? And as you walk with him, as you talk with him, as you enjoy fellowship with him, as you walk through trials and suffering and mountaintops and valleys with him, as your heart becomes deeper aligned with his own, the Spirit will prompt you, and it will be your joy to give him that which costs you most. Let's look at verse 3. It says, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. John's gospel tells us this woman, woman was Mary of Bethany. Again, Mary just enters into this room silently. She doesn't announce that she's coming and what she's come to do. She simply does what is in her heart to do. Mary is a profound character study. She is a model of what true, devoted worship of God looks like. Jesus, in John chapter 4, verses 23 through 24, says this, The hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We have a great example of true devotion. What I want you to notice first, this will be the first of five points here this morning, is that true devotion is sacrificial. Notice what Mary brought to Jesus. Look at the text. It says, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. This cost her a great deal. It had a great monetary value. Alabaster flasks were from a place called Alabaster in Egypt. The Greeks named them from the city that they came from, and because they came from so far away, they held great value. They were very costly. But it was not only the flask that was costly, but it was was what the flask contained that was costly. It was filled with spikenard. That was the most expensive oil in existence at that time. John's Gospel tells us that she had a pound of it. That's a lot of oil. She had a pound of oil. Mark's gospel tells us that it was worth 300 denarii. This is equivalent to a year's wage. Often spices and ointments were used as investments because they were small, they were portable, and they were easily sold. And you understand the the monetary value of what Mary is getting ready to give to Jesus. It was all that she had. It was her life savings. It was her investment. It was her savings account. It was her retirement. And it was her future security was contained in this flask. So it didn't only have monetary value, but it also has sentimental value. The value of this oil and its identification as spikenard suggests that it was a family heirloom that was passed from one generation to another, from mother to daughter. So in this room again is Mary's sister Martha and Mary's brother Lazarus, and she brings the family heirloom. And no doubt they're probably thinking, what what are you doing with that and why are you here with it, Mary? They would have known what it would have meant. They understood the family value of what she was doing. Had monetary value, had sentimental value. But Jesus, was worth more than both. 
Jesus was worth more than both. She gave the most valuable possession that she owned. But why? Why did she give this to Jesus? It's simple. It's because Jesus was more valuable to her than, than the sacrifice that she was about to give. That's when true worship takes place. When that which you are, when, when the person you are sacrificing to is more valuable than that which you are sacrificing. Remember what David would pray and, and, or say in 1 Chronicles? I will not give to God that which costs me nothing. But why did David say that? He said that because he knew his God. David is one of the greatest character studies in all of the Bible. He was a lover of God. Paul would say, um, Yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So this costly flask, alabaster flask with oil in it, was not only expensive monetarily, expensive sentimentally, but it also had spiritual value. An object has no spiritual value until it's given sacrificially to Jesus. Notice what Mary did with the alabaster flask of very costly oil. Look at the text again. It says, then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. So true devotion is sacrificial. And secondly, true devotion comes from bro brokenness. Though the, the flask was expensive here on earth and it had great sentimental value to Mary and her family, it had no spiritual value until it was broken. This broken alabaster flask is a type of the sacrifice that God requires. Remember what David would say after his sin with Bathsheba and after Nathan the prophet calls him out on it and he's praying in Psalm 51 and he says, against you and you only have I sinned. He says in Psalm 51, 16 and 17, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God are are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. It was valuable to Jesus because it was completely broken and completely poured out. Which typifies our lives, right? That's what Paul says in Romans 12.1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You may be going through a season of great contriteness of heart and great brokenness. You feel like you're constantly being poured out for the sake of Christ on, in behalf of others. And you're right where Jesus wants you. And your sacrifice of brokenness and your sacrifice of being poured out for the sake of others and the glory of Christ doesn't go unnoticed. That's a beautiful thing about what's taking place in the life of Mary. Everything that she is doing is being misunderstood, but she's not doing it for anyone else. She's doing it for her Savior. And the Lord is not unaware of her own brokenness. This alabaster flask typifies an inward reality of the heart of a person who is truly devoted to Christ. One missionary would say, he is no fool who will give what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. She doesn't lose this opportunity. Just as the alabaster flask had no eternal value until it was broken, the oil had no eternal value until it was poured out. That's a life of the believer, continually being broken and poured out, and broken and poured out. You remember Jesus in the uh, story of the feeding of the 5,000. The disciples would bring him the bread and the fish. And what happened with the bread and the fish in, in the hands of Jesus? It was broken and it was handed out and it was distributed. Then they would come back and he would break in it and it was handed out until it was distributed. You and I should be broken bread and poured out wine for the cause of Christ in the days that we're living in. Because that is the only place where true joy and true contentment is found. Joy is not found in self-preservation. Joy is found in the giving of self away. To please the heart of the Father. We're all plagued by this question at some point in our lives, what are we here for? We're here to know God and to enjoy God, to glorify Him forever. But you won't know Him until you walk with Him through a season of great brokenness and experience His power flowing through your life 
and being a blessing to, blessing to others as you're simply walking with him and living a life of worship. It's true Christianity at its finest. It's what we were created to do. As we're willing to be broken and poured out for Christ. Paul said this at the end of his life. He was, a, let me say this, he was able to say this at the end of his life. 2 Timothy 4, 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He goes on to say, I finished the race. I've, I fought the fight. Oh, that we would all be able to say that at the end of our race. That I have been poured out as a drink offering for Christ. We must be broken, poured out, in that order, in this we see this act of devotion. So we've seen this, this example of worship in the life of Mary, that her devotion to Christ was sacrificial. It cost her a great deal. It cost her her future security in giving away of this, in this breaking of the alabaster flask of spikenard. It was costly to her. It was sacrificial. We saw in her life that this example of true devotion comes from a place of real brokenness. Now we're going to say that, see that true devotion is selfless. Look again at verse 3. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. It was customary during this time for the forehead of a guest to be anointed with a dab of oil as they entered into a house. But notice what Mary does. She poured the whole flask on his head. I have a, one, of, one of my daughters, I'm sure you've seen her around here, jumping off the pews, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> There's times where she goes through breathing challenges and my wife will at time, any essential oil people in here? Yeah, I see you. There's always some of them. <laughs> Only a few drops in a diffuser, and what happens? The whole house is filled with that fragrance. Mary pours a pound of it on Jesus. All of it. She holds nothing back. I love what the parallel account in John 12 says, Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. This is significant. It's important that we understand the, the act of Mary during this time. Mary appears in Scripture on three separate occasions, and in every occasion we see her at the feet of Jesus. In Luke chapter 10, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus learning. In John chapter 11, after her brother Lazarus died, Mary is at the feet of Jesus and she is surrendered. In our text here this morning, in John chapter 12 as well, Mary is anointing Jesus' feet and honoring Jesus. Why is this significant? Because to attend to the feet was the task of the lowliest servant. This was an act of not only devotion, but it was an act of humility. And notice what she does. It also says in John 12, 3, that she wiped his feet with her hair. Jewish women in the time would never unbind their hair in public. It was a sign of disrespect. It was a sign of, of loose morals. But notice what Mary was not. She was not self-focused. Her devotion was selfless. She gave no thought of her status or reputation. She was supremely devoted to Christ. Mary's worship was sacrificial, and it came from a place of brokenness and selflessness. This is the worship that pleases God and blesses others. John 12, 3 goes on to say that the house was filled with the fragrance of this oil. And no doubt was the body of Christ as he would go on through the remainder of this week. So we've seen what true devotion looks like in the life of Mary, that it's sacrificial, that it comes from brokenness, that it is selfless, but it's also often criticized by others. Look at verses 4 and 5 with me. It says, but there were some who were indignant among themselves. Who were, who were those some? It was the disciples, no doubt. 
and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? Such an amazing thing to see. So undiscerning. Right? Because the Lord told the disciples on many occasions that we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners, I'm going to be beaten, mocked, and spat upon, I'm going to be crucified, and on the third day I'm going to rise again. And yet they are completely absent-minded from the reality of what could possibly take, be taking place in the heart and the mind of their own leader. So unaware of what's taking place around them that they think this act of devotion is wasted. Verse 5, it says, For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they criticized her sharply. This word criticized is an interesting word in the original. It means to be angry, it means to scold, and it means to warn sternly. They're yelling at her as she is giving everything she has to Christ. She's being misunderstood. But she's also paying no attention to it. John's gospel gives us a very interesting account. John tells us that it was Judas that said this, the one who kept the money bag. Judas called Mary's act of devotion a waste, which is interesting because in John 17, Jesus refers to Judas as the son of perdition. In the original language, the word perdition means waste. Uh, Judas was a waste, not Mary's sacrifice. When you're walking with Christ and you're doing what he asks you to do, when you're willingly giving up that which he has laid your finger on, his finger on in your heart for him, pay little mind to the opinions of others because you're laying it down at the feet of the one who gave it to you. Why is worship valuable? Why was sacrifice valuable? When the Lord asks something of you and he requires something of you in your life, our hearts should be overwhelmed with joy because we are able to lay it back at the feet of the one who gave it to us to begin with. I went through a season of my life where the Lord was asking me to give him that which was most special to me. And I agonized with him. I fought him on it. Prayed over it. Cried over it. Thought about it. But it never went away. You know, one of those times I say, ah, maybe I'm hearing him wrong. <laughs> I wasn't. But then I came to this portion of Scripture my heart was overwhelmed with joy because I had actually had something of value to lay back at his feet. Then it turned into worship. Then it turned into joy. Then it turned into something that was well-pleasing in the heart of the one who gave it to me anyways. You can never outgive God. Our devotion may be criticized by others, but notice what happens in the life of Mary. It's commended by Jesus. Look at verses 6 through 8. It says, but Jesus said, let her alone. Notice she doesn't defend herself. I love what Pastor Chuck used to always say. If you uh, defend yourself, God will let you. He's far better at defending us than we are of defending ourselves. He steps in. The mouth of the master offers rebuke to the heart of Judas. And the other disciples for questioning her devotion. But Jesus said, I'm so thankful. But sometimes we can read through text too quick. You meditate on that for a little bit. Here this woman is at the feet of Jesus, giving everything to him, wiping his feet with her hair. They're criticizing her, yelling at her, criticizing her sharply. And what, what, what happens? Her, her, her heart and her mind, her eyes are fixed on Jesus and the Lord takes care of the criticism. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work, notice, for me. It wasn't for you. So why do you have an opinion about it? It was for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you do them good. But me you do not always have. This should have been a lightning bolt of truth to their hearts. Me you do not have with you always. 
She has done what she could. Underline that in your Bibles. Take note of that. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Amazing. Jesus defended her. Jesus knew exactly why Mary was anointing him. Mary was a discerner because she often sat at the feet of Jesus and waited upon him. She was able to discern the significance of what was taking place. That's such a word for us here today. There is a danger of being overly informed in the ways of this world. We should never know more about what's going on in this world than we do about what's going on in the heart of Jesus as it pertains to him and his kingdom. But because she sat with him, because she was devoted to him, even all the disciples who would turn the world upside down for Jesus completely missed what was really going on. She knew that he was going to die. And beyond that, she loved him. She loved him supremely. In Luke 11, when Mary sat at his feet, she recognized him as a prophet as she learned from him. In John chapter 11, when she fell at his feet in grief, she recognized him as our sympathizing high priest, as he had compassion on her and ministered to her after the the death of her brother. And when she anointed his feet and wiped them with her hair, she recognized him as king, that he was about to triumph over death. And just as priests and prophets and kings were anointed in the Old Testament, it was fitting for a great high priest and king to be anointed. And Mary, this lowly woman who simply loved Jesus, had the opportunity to do it. Look at verse 9 with me. Jesus goes on to say, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told in mention of her. She didn't do it for that. But again, notice the internal value of it. Because of her devotion to Christ, we are looking into her life today. Because of your devotion to Christ and what you are willingly give to him and what you willingly sacrifice for his behalf will have eternal value. It will please the heart of the Father, and it will become an opportunity, a teachable moment in the lives of others. Even if it is you simply giving him your trust during a season of uncertainty and doubt. Because as you walk with him, as you're devoted to him, he comforts you. And the Bible says that we are comforted so that we can comfort others with the same comfort that we are comforted with in our suffering. This is about Mary and Jesus. And the Lord blesses her. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Jesus didn't only defend her, but he commended her. It was Mary's act of worship that she was remembered for. That's what we want to be remembered for not necessarily great steps of faith or accomplishing great tasks here on this earth, but great love and devotion to Jesus. Let's wrap this up. Verses 10 and 11 says, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief. Notice this. This is amazing to me. I can't, my mind isn't, cannot be released from this. He just saw what happened. The Lord is so gracious to give opportunities to Judas before his betrayal. He always gives us opportunities to avoid the temptation, right? The Bible tells us that no temptation has overtaken you except is common to man. But in all temptation, he is faithful to give us a way of escape. It says, then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, one who heard him, one who saw him, one who experienced him, one who was called by him, one who just experienced this amazing act of devotion, goes then, after he sees this, to the chief priest to betray him. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. Notice the difference between Judas and Mary. Uh, Mary is giving away that which was most precious to her. Judas is trying to gain because Jesus wasn't precious to him. He looked at Jesus as a means to an end, not the end itself. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought 
Notice this at the end of verse 11. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. This is so wicked. Conveniently betray him. Looking for opportunity. Going behind his back. Lacking integrity. This is, if Mary is the the epitome of devotion, Judas is on the opposite end of the spectrum. One openly and selfishly worships Jesus, the other secretly and conveniently betrays Jesus. But it's important that we highlight that we draw out from this text that both had eternal consequences. One condemned by his act of selfishness. What do we know in the life of Judas? He betrays Jesus, and what what does he do? He betrays Jesus with a kiss. The eyes of Judas meet the eyes of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as the cohort of soldiers are behind Judas, and it's like the scene slows down when you're reading the Gospels, and Jesus looks into the eyes of Judas, and he says, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? And the language says that he continued to kiss him. And then he goes out and he hangs himself. An eternal consequence. One selflessly worships, the other secretly betrays. One commended by his act of selfishness, the other commended by her act of loving, selfless, discerning devotion. That's the aim here this morning. That's the goal. Let's not overcomplicate the season of our life that we're in. Life is made up by various seasons, and in each season, Jesus is present and active in doing something wonderful in our lives. And if we are willing and able to walk closely to him and undistracted from the chaos around us. The scene, the times, the culture, the political scene, the religious scene, the relational scene in the life of Mary, everything was coming unglued around her. But none of that detracted her from Jesus Christ himself. That should be the focus of our lives. Jesus Christ himself and walk in a true devotion that is sacrificial. Be willing to live a life of devotion that comes from a place that is broken and being poured out for the sake of others and the glory of God. That our devotion to Jesus would be selfless and understanding that it's often going to be criticized by the undiscerning, not understanding hearts of those around us. But our devotion will always be commended by God. I'll close with this verse. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, the simple truth that you are seeking worshipers is amazing to us. Lord, help us to never be too far removed. From what it is that you are after in our lives. And our commitment to you and our worship of you. So Lord, we would ask that you keep us close to your hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand? Close with a song.